In a couple of previous videos, we discussed the term structure of interest rates. And the term structure of interest rates is a way to try and understand the yield curve. The yield curve is a plot of maturity or term to maturity against yield to maturity. And we'd like to understand why does this yield curve have the shape it does? And we have several yield curves, one for May 31st, 2012, one from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago, etc. So why is the rate nearly zero for the three-month Treasury bill on May 31st, yet on that same date, it happens to be um, perhaps two and three-quarter percent for the 30-year bond? Why does it have this shape? Okay, so the term structure helps us to understand this relationship, but it actually doesn't help us to forecast interest rates. What we need to do to get a good forecast of interest rates is we'd like to model interest rates. Okay, we'd like to produce some sort of interest rate model. And if we use the expectation theory, then long-term rates are determined by current and future short-term rates. So rather than modeling all the interest rates, if we can model short-term rates, we can use this information to forecast long-term rates. Now, what's an interest rate model? Well, an interest rate model is a probabilistic description of how interest rates can change over time. And to have a good interest rate model, we need to incorporate certain statistical properties of interest rate movements, drift, volatility, and mean reversion. Now, a complete discussion of interest rate models is beyond the scope of a, a short little video tutorial here, and it requires that you understand stochastic differential equations. But let's just at least try and get a basic understanding of what interest rate models look like. Okay, The most common interest rate models assume that short-term interest rates follow some statistical process and that other short rates or other rates in the term structure are related to the short rate. So basically you're you're using the expectation theory after you model the short rates. And since we're only looking at short rates, we call this a one-factor model. Now you could create a two-factor model where you're looking at short rates and long rates, but that makes it quite more quite a bit more complicated. So usually we stick with looking at a one-factor model. So let's look at the dynamics of the short rate. Okay, This falls under the heading of a stochastic differential equation. But let's just try and get a basic understanding of this. Okay, The equation is dr equals b dt plus sigma dz. And what are these things? Well, dr is just the change in the short rate. B is the expected direction of rate change, or what we call the drift term. Sigma is the standard deviation of the changes in the short rate, and that's our volatility term. And dz here denotes a random process. Okay, I may have forgotten to mention dt. dt is the change in time, or equivalently, the length of the interval, the length of the time interval. So let's see what this says here. Basically, this says that the change in the short rate over time interval dt depends on the expected direction of the change in the short rate, which is determined by b, and some random process dz that is affected by volatility. Now, that random nature of the change in the short rate comes from the random process dz. And there's some assumptions we're going to make here. Um, the random term z follows a normal distribution of mean 0 and standard deviation of 1. The change in the short rate is proportional to the value of the random term, which depends on the standard deviation of the change in the short rate. The change in the short rate for any two different short intervals of time are independent. 
Okay, the expected value of the change in the short rate is equal to the drift term. Well, let's think about that. If the if the um, expected value of z is equal to zero, then if we take the expected value, then we get this drift term business. Okay, in the case where b is zero, the expected value of the change in the short rate is zero. Okay, that basically means the expected value of the short rate is its current interest rate. And in the special case where b is zero and the variance is one, the variance of the change in the short rate over some interval of length t is equal to t, and so the standard deviation is the square root of t. Okay, we're not going to work through that, just this is a property that's um, true in this case. Okay, what we didn't do in the previous equation was that neither the drift term nor the standard deviation of the change in the short rate depended on the level of the short rate and the time. So we can rewrite this model as dr, again, the change in the short rate, equals the drift term, which is a function of the current level of interest rates and time times dt, the change in time, okay, plus the standard deviation, which is a function, again, of the interest rate and time times this random process, dz. And we refer to this equation as an ETO process. Now, if, you, if you've studied option pricing, Black-Scholes model, for example, you'll also use ETO, the ETO process to price that out. Okay, again, but this is a little bit beyond the scope of this little tutorial here. But we can still get a basic understanding of how this works. All right, so we want to specify some property or some dynamics of the drift term. And what we're going to do here is we're going to assume mean reversion. Mean reversion means that, gee, when, the, when uh, rates are high, they'll probably go back to being lower at some point. When rates are very low, they'll probably go up at some point. And this is very common in, not just in finance, but in all kinds of things in life that when you're above or below the average, you tend to move back towards the average. Right now, as I'm making this video, interest rates are very low. Interest rates are likely to go up sometime because they can't really get much lower than they are. When they were very high back in the uh, early 80s and the late 70s, they came down. Okay, That's something that would likely happen. So what we do here is we've modeled this and we have this negative term here, this negative alpha times this change. So let's see what we have here. We also want to specify the dynamics of the volatility term. And we're going to assume that volatility does not depend on time. And that, that sort of makes sense, right? Why should it be more volatile, you know, six months from now than today? But we're going to assume that it depends on the rate. So we're going to get rid of the t, and we're going to say that volatility is only a function of the rate. And so one general formulation we can use is that sigma times r raised to the gamma power times dz, where gamma is what we're going to call the constant elasticity of variance. And depending on what number we put in for gamma, gives us different interest rate models. Okay, It turns out that if you let gamma equal zero, then this term is going, the, the standard deviation is just going to be sigma. And this is the Vasicek specification. If you happen to use gamma equal to one, then you're going to get sigma times r, and this is the Dothan specification. And if you use the, the gamma equals one half, you're going to get that the standard deviation is going to be equal to sigma times the square root of r, and this is the well-known 
Cox Ingersoll Ross specification. And one of the nice things about the Cox Ingersoll Ross specification is that it doesn't allow for negative interest rates. Okay? These models do allow for negative interest rates, and that doesn't really make much sense. So let's take a look at, at one possible specification. If we incorporate these terms in here, the drift term and then that square root term, we get something referred to as the mean reverting square root model. So this is a way to, to model interest rates. Um, basically, I got this discussion from Fabozzi's Bond Markets Analysis and Strategy book. And uh, even in his text, he doesn't go into great detail because it's, it's a very complicated process. Unless you're a financial engineer, you're probably not going to, to study stochastic differential equations. But having some basic idea of how to model interest rates can be valuable in sort of understanding the process here. 